I work at probably the premier hospital in New York City. It is a 1200 bed hospital. We do everything from surgery to transplants, lung transplants, heart transplants. Um, at this point, we do none of that. Almost none of that. Um, our hospital is almost exclusively a COVID-19 hospital. Where in the past, what I've been doing is seeing old people with pneumonias or seeing people with bleeds. Um, almost exclusively what I do all day long is see people with COVID-19. And so my job is to decide um, which patients um, need ventilators. And um, once patients are put on ventilators, how long they have to stay on them, the treatment of these patients. And so I'm kind of in a unique position um, to kind of comment on what's going on. I want to, the reason I want to have this call is because I don't want you guys to be scared. Um, we're three months into this in the medical world and we understand this disease. Um, and so I'm going to go through kind of ways to protect your family and then what to do if and when, um, given the size of this call, it's a when um, someone gets COVID and how um, we can protect our circle. Um, you may hear a little inflection in my voice, like I'm emotional. It's not because I'm scared. It's actually the opposite. Um, for the first time in a while, I'm actually not scared. Um, and so I'm going to share with you why, uh, why that is. What I want you guys to know is that um, every single day we're getting better. We know more. And I am confident that the stuff I can tell you today um, should make you guys feel um, like when this comes to your community, that you don't have to be scared and that you can protect your family. Okay, so let's um, get into stuff that's actually helpful for you. <laughs> so the first thing is just what is COVID-19? I mean, it's, it's now every single news story, it's political, it's economic, but what is this disease? Um, so this is um, a virus. Um, it's from what we would colloquially think of as a common cold family, the coronavirus family. Um, but what's unique is that um, the human body has never seen this virus before. And so one of the common questions I get is, what does this disease look like? Um, and so what commonly people have is they have fever and they have cough and then they have sore throat. And when they get this, the virus goes through their entire body. And what we have found is that the most likely place that this will affect um, is your lungs. And so um, people will commonly have cough, um, but for about 80% of people, you just don't feel good is the most common thing. You have a mild cough, maybe you have a little headache. And so the way that you get this is the transmission of the virus almost exclusively from your hands to your face from your hands to your face. And so it's either into your eyes, into your nose, or into your mouth. So there's a lot of talk about contact or getting it through contact, hands to face. There's also a small thought that it can be aerosolized, that it can kind of exist a little bit in the air. The thought at this point is that you actually have to have very long sustained contact with someone. And I'm talking about over 15 to 30 minutes in an unprotected environment, meaning you're in a very closed room without any type of mask for you to get it that way. But to very simply state, the overwhelming majority of people are getting this by physically touching someone who has this disease or will develop it in the next one to two days and then touching their face. And so that actually, I think, is incredibly empowering. And that's, as I've been in the hospital the last two days, I've, the, the thing that makes me smile a little bit is that I actually know now that I won't get this disease because I know how to protect myself. Simple statement of fact, COVID is in your community. I'm going to say that again. Whether you live in Texas, whether you live in Tennessee, whether you live in Florida, it is in your community right now. 
that is not to scare you. That is to just tell you so that you can then take the steps that I'm talking about and not be scared. You have to start psychologically working on the connection between your hands and your face. So I'm terrible at this. I touch my face all the time, literally all the time. Um, you don't even realize that you move your hand, you know, you scratch your nose. And so the virus has taken advantage of this. And the reason why everyone gets this disease is because you have sustained contact with someone. So someone at a party has this and you shake their hand, right? And then you touch your face. It's that simple. That is how you get this disease. So what does that mean? I think there's two practical things that you can do. One is just to start to be aware of when you touch your face. Atul Gawande, who is a um, uh, Harvard-trained surgeon, I think is very famous, um, actually has a recommendation to, for people to just start wearing masks. And the idea here is not that the mask is going to prevent you from getting COVID, because as I said, it's not a disease that you're most likely getting from the air. But the reason to put on a mask is because, and I do this in the hospital, is you stop touching your face. And so what I would recommend is now when you're leaving your house is to wear a mask. And, it's, and I think those two things combined is incredibly powerful and will prevent the transmission of the disease into your family in 99% of cases. To know your hands are clean and to not touch your face. Period. You don't need a medical mask. These masks that people are wearing are not protecting them from getting the disease. And front care healthline workers need these masks right now. That's not to say don't wear a medical mask. If you have one, that's great. Put it on. But it doesn't mean you have to have a wild supply of masks or N95s or anything like that. The general community has zero need for an N95 mask, zero. In the hospital, where all I do is take care of patients with COVID-19, I only wear a mask, of N95 mask, if I'm in the room with that patient doing something that's going to make them have aerosolization of the, the, the virus. That is no one in the community. The four things, I think I said four things. Always know where your hands are and have Purell. When you touch stuff that's outside your home, just make sure that you're washing your hand. Start to learn how to not touch your face. A really good way to do that is to start wearing a mask when you're out. And if you wanna practice, wear a mask when you're home. Number three is you don't need an N95 mask or, or a medical mask. Any mask will do because this is not preventing the disease. This is training you. And then the fourth thing is just stay away from people. Not, not stay away from people. Stay three to six feet away from people. <laughs> you don't have to be scared of the outside world now. You don't have to be scared of your neighbor. And I have actually found that to be incredibly liberating right now. It's a time when we're all really scared. Um, and I think it's what makes it worse is to when you go outside and to look and think that the person next to you is gonna somehow harm you or harm your family. But when you know that the only way you're gonna get this disease is if your hands are dirty and that if you touch your face and that if you are way too close to that person, that becomes incredibly liberating. And then all of a sudden, the person at the store is not your enemy. There's someone who's going through this with you. The delivery person is not your enemy. They're a hero. They're going out and, and delivering food at a time when there's a communicable disease that they don't understand. The mailman is a hero. You know, these are people that we have to, the same way we're acknowledging and celebrating healthcare providers. When you understand this disease and know exactly what to do to prevent getting it, then it allows us for the next couple of weeks to months to be able to to sustain the system that we have. We have to be able to have mail. We have to be able to get delivery and seamless in New York City. It's the only way we eat. Um, but if you can protect yourself and you know your family's safe, then I think that's empowering. Socially, is you have to shrink your social circle. 
And so what does that mean? So what I would highly encourage you guys to do as the country is shutting down is find your isolation group, find your, um, your, your group of three people, four people, your family, um, and set boundaries. That is it. The people who are going to get this are people who are maintaining large social circles at this point. So what did that mean for my family? And so Jean Young um, and our kids and my mom are on the farm. They're at the Hopewell house. And that is exclusively the social circle that they're, they're circling in. They talk to their family every day. They see people, you know, like through FaceTime, but there's no one coming in and out of the house. If you develop a fever and you are otherwise fine and isolate yourself from your family. So what does that mean? It's just simply about the same rules about your hands and touching your face is you don't want sustained contact with the person who's sick to the point where you're going to be able to pick this up off of surfaces or off their person and then touch your face. So what are people recommending? If you're able, have the person in a separate room. If you're able, have the person um, who's sick have their own bathroom. If the person has to come out and interact with people in the family, this is a perfect indication for one medical mask. And the reason is you want to put the mask on the person who's sick. And so if in our apartment, if I was sick and I had to come out and interact with my family, before I would leave the bedroom, I would wash my hands, I would put on a mask, and then I would go out. You shouldn't be scared to stay at home with your family with a fever if you have COVID-19. The vast majority of people are going to have a fever, body aches, feel like shit for three to five days, feel a little less, less shit on seven, and then they're going to start to feel better. You can start interacting with your family more as you feel better, as your fever is gone, but you're still going to be vigilant. You're going to be washing your hands. You're going to be a lot more confident 20 days out from the disease than you are 10 days out from the disease. The current recommendation from the CDC is that if I get sick and if I'm feeling better, I can put on a mask and go to work. And so I think that that is a good indication to you that that's when you can start interacting with your family. There are a couple exceptions to that, and I think this is important. If you have a vulnerable population in your family, so if you're living with your um, lovely 95-year-old grandmother, um, if you know there's someone in your house who had recent chemotherapy and someone in the house gets sick, you need to find another living arrangement for that patient or practice incredibly, incredibly strict isolation of that family member. We know that the the older population is the, the sickest population um, when they get this disease. And so that is the one caveat to the you, it's safe to stay home with your family is if you have someone who's incredibly vulnerable, you need to um, set up a situation in the house where they're completely isolated from the person who is sick. But simply being in the home with someone with COVID-19 will not get you that disease. It goes back to the same three principles. It's touching a person or a surface who has COVID-19, and then touching your face. First, who should go to the hospital? If you're feeling short of breath, come to the hospital. That is the rule. That is the clearest thing. It's not, I have a fever. It's not, I think I have COVID-19. It's not, I can't stop having those body aches. It's, I feel short of breath when I get up to go to the bathroom. Those are people that should come to the hospital and be evaluated. So of the entire population of people who get COVID-19, about 10% need to go to the hospital because they get short of breath. Of the 10% who are coming to the hospital, about 1% to 2 to 3% of those are requiring admission to the ICU and to be put on the ventilator. So what happens when people get put on ventilators? The vast majority of people, overwhelming majority of people, come off the ventilator. And they usually come off the ventilator seven to 10 um, days later. Um, 
But I, I think the important thing for you guys to know is going to the hospital is not a death sentence. It's a safe place for you to be. Um, go to the hospital when you're short of breath. Don't go to the hospital just because you have COVID-19. Because if your community, whether that's New York or Tennessee, is testing a lot and you have clear access to testing, absolutely getting a test is a good idea. Because when it's negative, then in a day when you're feeling better, you can have full interaction with your family. So I think that is the key. But if you live in a community where there's very rare testing going on at this point, do not try and jump the line to someone who's actually short of breath and, do, and really not doing well, just to make yourself feel better, to know that you have it. Just take the precautions in your home that I said, and then as, resting te as testing ramps up, then we'll be able to, to get more people tested. There's almost no COVID disease in the population from age zero to age 14. So I'll just state that again. Kids are not getting sick. Now, there are some exceptions. You know, there's a recent New England Journal article where they went into a hospital in Wuhan, China, a pediatric hospital. And in the entire hospital of 300 kids, they found 2% of them or 4% of them had COVID, which really looked like cough or asthma. So kids are not dying. Kids are not getting critically ill. Kids are not getting sick. There's a whole debate about whether kids are transmitting this disease. It's probably true. Um, but I think if the, the gist of the question is how does this affect infants and newborns, um, it's really not. Yes, please. If you're in a city, you can go outside. Just follow the rules. When you go outside, peer all your hands. When you're going to touch the elevator button, when you touch the door, peer all your hands. Don't touch your face. When you're out walking in the city, don't come within three to six feet of people. But say hello, smile. No one is giving each other this disease by walking through a city. If there's a bike path, you can walk on it. The only caveat is just don't get sloppy. Don't, you know, the, the problem with telling people they can do things is that everyone just assumes their old lifestyle. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's safe in New York City, in Philadelphia, to go on a walk. Just follow the rules. Just follow the rules. I would encourage you to wear a mask, not because you're getting the COVID from people when you're outside. It's because as a society over the next couple of months, we need to train ourselves to not touch our face. And we need to tell people that we're taking this disease seriously. It's not because you need to wear a mask in the city, because that's how you're getting the disease. It's all back to the basic two to three rules. So yes, go outside, have a short walk, breathe, know that the world is going to be here, and then go back inside and follow all the rules. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that, what people are using in the absence of Purell. I think any, that's another thing to say, to say to Stella, is this disease is a wimp. Coronavirus is a wimp. It dies as soon as you disinfect it. So uh, I can get back on the exact thing, but just generally any type of disinfectant. And then if you're going out and you don't have Purell, press the elevator with your elbow. You know, open the door with your shoulder. You know, that's not gonna that's not gonna get you COVID. Um, ideally, if you have Purell, all you need is a small drop. You're gonna kill this thing. This thing doesn't violate the rules. There's not a mystery disease, um, and so I think that that's a, a good point. Um, where there's a lot of um, contact with stuff that you're getting delivered. I think it's a reasonable idea to have the delivery person leave the food that they're delivering to you outside your door. Um, you could probably pick it up with a, a glove and then just open the, the bag and all the inside contents are fine. That's a, an overabundance of caution, but I think is reasonable. What you don't want to do is high five the delivery man. You don't want to shake the delivery man's hand. <laughs> you don't want to pick up the, the plastic bag that you're getting from Seamless and you know have a, a huge, long interaction with that bag because, of course, it's possible a delivery person has COVID. But again, if you follow the rules and everything you touch, you just clean your hands, 
you will not get it. Continue to order food. Um, but no, I don't think you have to have routine groceries wiped down. I think that's a complicated question. I think if the simple question is, can both the Starbucks barista and you safely interact through that transaction? I think the answer is yes. Um, is it important that um, Starbucks and people that work there continue to have jobs? Yes. My general sense, given that we're all hunkered down, is to make your coffee at home. Um, if you're going to go to Starbucks drive through follow the rules. Wash your hands, accept the, the coffee, wash your hands, and then drink your coffee. And I, what I mean is a, a drop of Purell or something equivalent to that. So um, if you can make your coffee and stay home, I would, I would recommend staying home. If you're completely safe to go to Starbucks, just follow the rules. Absolutely not. That is a recommendation for healthcare providers. Like for me, who um, I live in rooms with COVID patients, you know, for 12 straight hours. Um, for me, I will take off my clothes and wash them. And I have a whole procedure for that. Um, for people who are generally going out, who are following the rules, wear your clothes. No, no problem. Don't go to the doctor. Don't go to the hospital. Um, the only rule for going to the hospital is if you're short of breath. What is amazing now is the, during the COVID um, outbreak is the use of telehealth. And so by far, if you feel sick and you're a little nervous, um, whatever your healthcare um, provider is for us, it's, you know, I work for Wild Cornell. We have Wild Cornell Connect. Um, we have an army of doctors who are at home waiting to take your call who will tell you um, that you have uh, uh, nothing or that you have COVID-19 and you should stay home. So do not go to the doctor. Um, do not go to the hospital. Um, I would encourage you to use telemedicine, which is completely rampant right now because we have a ton of doctors who are at home and will take your call over the internet. Everyone listen, please listen to what I'm going to say. This disease affects everyone who's not in the age group of zero to 14. So 23 year olds, 35 year olds, 45 year olds with zero medical problems are getting this disease. People like that are coming to the hospital. People like that are going on ventilators. There is a very evil narrative early in this um, disease that said that this is only a disease of old people and people who have hypertension or people who have diabetes. That is not true. I can tell you because all I do is take care of patients. It hits the entire spectrum of ages. So that includes older people who do worse. We see a little bit more older people, but we see a ton of 35 year olds and we will understand it someday, but we don't understand it right now. And so it's not to scare you, just follow the rules. If you can get this disease from age 20 years old, maybe 16 years old, all the way up to age 105. And you can get sick and end up on mechanical ventilation, on a ventilator. The younger you are, the less likely that is to happen. The older you are, the more likely that is to happen. But we see young people who get really sick and we see old people who do just fine. And so I think it's a great question, Chris. I don't think we know exactly um, why young people are also getting sick, but it's just to say, follow the rules. If everyone does it, you're going to be fine. You're not going to get the disease. If you get the disease, follow the rules. You can protect your family. Most people will be fine. If you're short of breath, go to the hospital. So I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. Very interesting question about ibuprofen. We're not using it in the hospital anymore. There's really good data from Germany that um, there's uh, worse outcomes in people, more inflammation in people who use ibuprofen. So that's simple answer, which is if you have a fever, take acetaminophen, Tylenol. So don't use ibuprofen, use Tylenol. It's very simple. For a doctor, incredibly simple. They all look the same. They all get the same treatment. For them, it's scary. And it's our job to kind of make them a little less scared. And what I tell every young person or old person that I have to put on a ventilator is we're putting you on because we are going to get you off. And I think that that's 
true. So if you have people or you know people who are sick and they're short of breath, they shouldn't be scared. They should go to the hospital and we will take care of them. This is incredibly predictable. Um, and so um, I think social distancing will be for um, months to potentially a year, um, which I know sounds like a lot, but I think the, the experience from Wuhan, um, the experience from um, Singapore, the experience from South Korea, um, is that the first thing you do is you flatten the curve. Um, the first thing you do is you bring down the amount of cases so hospitals don't get overwhelmed. And then by human nature, people will become a little relaxed with their social distancing. And so there's a, then a second small spike. And then after the second small spike, um, it usually comes under control in the population. And so I think social distancing is something that you need to just put in your brain. Um, I think it's something that is just the way of life for the indefinite future. But now that you know the rules, it's not something to be afraid of. It's just a different way of interacting. And as this becomes controlled over the next three to six to nine months in this country, then you'll know exactly who you'll be able to hug. You'll know exactly who you'll be able to touch. You'll be able to, uh, I think, feel better. I'd say the first focus for everyone on this call over the next seven to 14 days is to learn the rules. Learn the rules. Because as soon as you learn the rules, it's empowering. And then you can start living your life in a new normal, which will go on for three to six to nine months. <laughs> people are absolutely becoming immune. The, the stories you're hearing about people having rebound um, symptoms is usually the fact that they just haven't fully resolved the disease. So let me say that more clearly. <laughs> so we know that from the a day or two before you have the disease until about 14 days into the disease that you're spreading the disease to the environment. We know that because scientists have done tests of the nose every single day to know which people are going to spread the disease. They don't do it to everyone, but the scientists know who those people are. What they have observed is that at 14 days, people will not be shedding the disease from their nose, but then at day 16, they will be. We don't think that that's because they've relapsed in their disease or not developed immunity. We think it's just because they're slowly coming down and the test is just picking up a little bit. And so the vast majority, so 81,000 people in China got this disease, 76,000 have recovered with antibodies that prevent them from getting the disease. Wow. The natural course of this disease is that once the world sees it, coronavirus now as a pandemic is going to enter the circulation the same way rhinovirus is in our circulation, the same way that respiratory syncytial virus is in our circulation. But as it mutates, it's going to get milder and milder. And so five years from now, um, you're going to get, get coronavirus, this exact COVID-19, and it's going to feel like a cold, just not the first time through the population.